Welcome, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the BirdLife East Atlantic Flyway Initiative, I want to welcome to this webinar. We have a, a, an interesting agenda. I hope we, uh, I hope you all find it very interesting. Uh, this is in the framework of a World Migratory uh, Bird Day, which is organized by uh, by the Convention of Migratory Species. Uh, twice a year there's uh, this event and so in this case we join the the celebrations and i think that we should see the, we should see this as a celebration as well uh, i want to tell everyone that this this event is this webinar is being recorded um, and it will be shared uh, afterwards for those who want to who cannot attend but would like to see it uh, online so um, a couple of things we have a uh, translation uh, facilities french and english so uh, if you want to uh, make use of them you can select them at the bottom right of your uh, of your screen you should see uh, the option to choose english or french so choose the language you want to listen in uh, and you can also mute the original language so you're not listening to both languages at the same time. Uh, we have a, a webinar that is structured in, in uh, four sections. Uh, we're going to have uh, initially something about uh, policy frameworks where uh, we've got to hear from uh, from Amy Frankel and Jacques Touillet from respectively the Convention of Species and Iowa about the policy frame frameworks, uh, how they help us. Uh, we may get uh, Abaka Sugulu, who is the technical and uh, scientific yeah. technical yeah. director of the Pan-African Agency of the Great Green Wall, but he was having troubles with his connection and, and I'm not sure he will be able to join us. And then we're going to uh, have something about how we mobilize people to action and we're going to have for this uh, an update about the Turtle Dove Action Plan, which has so many stakeholders participating in it. Uh, a brief update about a workshop that took place earlier this week uh, in Ireland on migratory birds together with uh, uh, the European Commission or representatives from the European Commission. And also an update about the uh, East Atlantic Flyweight Youth Forum that took place last month. Uh, then we're going to have a section which is purely bird life and it's really two portions. One is about an initiative uh, supported by the East Atlantic Flyway Initiative, BirdLife's East Atlantic Flyway Initiative, which has small grants. We're going to hear about different projects and the progress they're making. And then we're going to hear some highlights from other BirdLife partners that are not necessarily linked to this uh, initiative. So as you see, it's a, a, a packed program, but uh, we hope that it's interesting for everybody. Uh, I think there's something for everyone. I hope you will enjoy it, and uh, and well, I think without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speakers. Uh, so they're going to share the presentation. We have uh, the EWA CMS policy framework and the need for a coordinated approach. It will be presented by Amy Frankel, who is executive secretary of the CMS, the Convention of Migratory Species. And Jacques Trouillet, who is the executive, executive secretary of the Africa Eurasian Water, uh, Waterbirds Agreement, Iowa. So thank you very much for, for being here, and the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Happy World Migratory Bird Day to all. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you and uh, to present with my uh, colleague and friend Jacques Trouillet. Uh, so, first, uh, you can go right to the next slide. I'm going to go fairly quickly. So the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals, otherwise known as CMS, uh, does include uh, really most of the countries uh, of concern in terms of the East Atlantic Flyway. And 
Thus, we provide a very important framework for cooperation on migratory species uh, and, of course, uh, for avian species, the subject of this discussion. Uh, it is uh, one of the uh, several MEAs or uh, environmental agreements under the UN. We have 132 parties, and we are really unique in that we're the only global treaty that focuses on the conservation of migratory species as well as their habitats. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of providing a, a coordinated approach, CMS, it's a very in interesting instrument because we have several different elements that really contribute to uh, a very large collection of work, not only by us, by the UN, but it's really creating kind of a framework and a platform for a lot of different aspects of, of activities to uh, help the conservation uh, for birds and these along the flyway. These include, of course, at the core of our convention is the listing of species that are vulnerable or endangered on either Appendix 1 or 2, which immediately uh, makes a commitment by parties uh, to carry out certain obligations for those species. We have specific COP resolutions, our conference of the parties, and decisions on avian species. We have action plans and initiatives that are aimed at certain threats to species or particular species conservation plans. We have what we call daughter agreements, and Iowa is one of those, uh, which is focused on a subset of issues uh, that is uh, covered by CMS. And finally, we have numerous projects, co cooperative arrangements with a variety of international, regional, and local entities. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, you know, at the core of CMS is the listing process. And I'll just note that on Appendix 1, if the species is listed there, uh, it does not allow the taking of that species. And there are very, very few exceptions to that. And it's an obligation of the signatories. Uh, the work to ensure that uh, there is no taking is, is primarily a commitment of the government, but there's much of the work by uh, stakeholders um, and scientific groups and others uh, really helps countries to achieve that goal. Um, I'm going to go right to the next slide, which gives an example of uh, one of the core resolutions relevant to this discussion. Which is we have a resolution that was adopted at one of our conferences of the parties that set out uh, a program, well, a decision and, and a resolution where we have a, a flyways program of work, which as you'll see by the date expires in 2023. And that date is very deliberate because that's when we have our next conference of the parties. So what that means is that we have an opportunity with all of you and, and the, uh, of course, the respective governments and stakeholders to look at what has worked well, what we need to improve and, and take that forward to our next COP. And I, I would also like to say that you know, with the flyways um, resolution, again, it's a very big tent. So it's setting out a lot of ambitious commitments, but to achieve those, it really depends on parties, international organizations, the UN itself and NGOs to help take that forward. Um, next slide, please. So I'm gonna give a couple of examples of uh, key thematic initiatives that are very, um, very active under CMS right now. One is the Intergovernmental Task Force on Illegal Killing of Birds in the Mediterranean. We have a coordinator, we have a program, we have regular meetings and data collection. And this is getting at, of course, a very key threat uh, to birds um, in the Mediterranean region. And uh, it's certainly, uh, there's been a lot of good successes and we still need more focus and attention to, to make sure that this is uh, fully implemented. Uh, next slide, please. Another key initiative is, and, and BirdLife, I should certainly acknowledge their uh, deep involvement with this one, which is the Energy Task Force. This is quite a unique initiative. It involves, uh, it's housed under CMS uh, as an umbrella. Uh, the Secretariat is, uh, is staffed by a BirdLife uh, staff member. And we have membership, including finance institutions, such as the World Bank Group. We have private sector entities. We have, again, uh, expert scientists. 
and, and other uh, entities all looking at how we can reconcile energy development, particularly renewable energy with reducing impacts on migratory species. So it's very practical. There's guidance that is developed and the goal is to get that guidance taken up by those who invest in major infrastructure projects so that they uh, use the best practice and uh, achieve the need for green energy while uh, re reducing the impacts on, on avian and bat species. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, thanks. Uh, so poisoning of birds is another threat to migratory species, vultures. Uh, we've had some incidents recently. And uh, I want to point out that we just, uh, well, at our last COP, there was a call for a new intergovernmental task force on phasing out the use of lead ammunition and lead fishing weights. And at our recent standing committee meeting, uh, we've just approved terms of reference for that group. So that group is ready to go forward. It's a pretty hot topic. The EU has just adopted a, a, a regulation on that. And it's certainly a, a big debate among the using the hunting community, the fishing community, uh, to look for safe alternatives, effective alternatives that are, are lead free and non-toxic. Um, I think it's the last slide, two more slides. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, just a very brief uh, slide to show you that we have uh, a variety of instruments that are part of what we call the CMS family. You'll hear from my head of uh, Iowa secretary in a minute. We also have, of course, uh, an MOU on raptors, which has quite a number of parties, uh, as well as specific species that have a, a focus due to their conservation status and particular action plans, uh, again, for species that need uh, particular attention, including the European turtle dove. And finally, one last slide to point out that in addition to what I've just uh, quickly described, we also have a number of projects on the ground with key partners. And just to highlight one, we have funding uh, from a donor to help us with this issue of bycatch of seabirds as well as sea turtles in, in the West African uh, industrial fisheries. So it's a very good partnership and uh, it goes deeper into some of the real pragmatic solutions uh, for that fishery. Uh, so with that, a uh, very quick overview. I'm gonna hand it to my friend and colleague, uh, Jacques Trudeau. Thank you. Well, thanks, Amy. May, may I have the next slide, please? Okay, so as explained by Amy, um, the AEVA, the African Eurasian Migratory Waterbird Agreement is a member of the CMS family is a legally binding uh, um, instrument uh, concluded more than 50, 20, 25 years ago. It has act, act now 82 parties, including the European Union. We are covering 255 migratory waterbird species. In fact, all migratory waterbird species along the flyway. And uh, for, for us and for the treaty, of course, the flyway approach is central. Next slide, please. So for example, along the, along the East Atlantic flyway, we have um, very efficient tools were implemented, which are the species action plan. And here you can see some of them, <coughs> black tail godwit, lesser flamingo, European spoonbill, and also a multi-species action plan for the Benguela coastal seabirds, so mainly from uh, Angola to, to South Africa. We, we, we are looking for, for coordinator for some others, corn cray, great snipe, pterogenous duck, black winch practicing call and macwa duck. So if you are interested in, please contact us. Next slide, just to show you what kind of action activities uh, implemented on the ground under the, the AIVA for the Benguela coastal bird. We have a, a first meeting on, uh, on the Benguela current forage fish workshop because, of course, it's essential to, to avoid uh, depleting the resource for these uh, birds. For the lesser flamingos, we are trying to better uh, know the, the route used by the lesser uh, flamingos. And for the northern bald ibis, we are working with Algeria to see if we can uh, repopulate uh, at least one site. 
and uh, it's worked because, as you may know, the the uh, IUCN red uh, list has downlisted this species, for example, because in, in Morocco we have a very good breeding success link with, of course, uh, the fact that the national park in Morocco are um, uh, looking for, for disturbance and preventing any, any poaching. Next slide, please. We have also a big project with FAO, the Food and Alimentation Organization, based in Roma. Uh, it concerns mostly the sub-Saharan African uh, countries, and we are trying to assess the socioeconomic importance of those uh, water birds um, uh, for food, for leisure, and so on. So it, it's the first study uh, of that kind in, in Africa. We, we have also worked uh, on the climate resilience site network in the African Eurasian Flyway, trying to assess where the trouble will happen in order to help countries to, to project their, their strategy with uh, water bird conservation and wetlands conservation. Next slide, please. And with that, I will give back the floor to Amy, or we can say thank you to you, all of you for, for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Amy Jacques. This is a really impressive, and, and thanks. It's an honor to have uh, both CMS and Iowa here joining us to celebrate the World Migratory Bird Day. Uh, I think since we have sections, what we're going to do is we're going to move on to the next presentation, and we're going to have a space for questions, uh, ans uh, questions uh, before we move to the next section. So. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Sugulu if if he can share his screen and 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 then we will have a presentation about uh, the Great Green Wall. Dr. Sugulu is uh, he is the technical and scientific director of the Pan African Agency of the Great Green Wall. Merci beaucoup. Une présentation sur l'Agence panafricaine de la Grande Muraille Verte, l'initiative de la Grande Muraille Verte pour le Sahara et le Sahel. Euh, J'aurais peut-être pour cela vous remercier de nous donner cette occasion. Euh, comme vous le savez, l'initiative de la Grande Muraille Verte pour le Sahara et le Sahel euh, est une initiative de 11 États membres euh, des pays, disons, sahéliens mais qui peut s'étendre donc à l'ensemble des autres pays de la zone Afrique sur comme Sahara qui peuvent notamment donc le vouloir y adhérer. Il y a une dizaine d'années, donc en juin 2017, l'initiative a été, ou l'agence panafricaine a été créée suite donc à une mise en, 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 en œuvre également par l'Union africaine en 2000, 2007. La présentation que j'ai l'honneur de vous présenter va être axée très rapidement sur tous les éléments d'information sur cette initiative. Donc, ce que, ce que je voudrais donc donner comme information, je vais entre temps demander, donc je vais faire une introduction très rapide sur le modèle euh, Grand Mirail Verte pour donner le plus d'informations possible. Le contexte, l'issue, les défis sont connus également, mais il fallait, c'est important que les gens le sachent, quelle est notre relation avec BirdLife C'est un peu euh, cette institution qui nous a permis euh, d'intégrer la dimension biodiversité, euh, n'est-ce pas, dans, dans les zones. Nous avons développé euh, un certain nombre de projets Euh, qui vont dans le sens de la caractérisation des zones humides. Euh, la biodiversité était un peu, si vous voulez, une faiblesse, parce qu'on verra plus tard, dans le cadre donc, des différents portefeuilles euh, de mise en œuvre de la Grande Grève Verte, la biodiversité trouve sa place, n'est-ce pas, au niveau euh, de la gestion durable des terres, aménagement des terres, de la biodiversité, et dans lequel nous remercions, euh, disons, l'agence, euh, le BirdLife, de nous avoir inventé là. Très rapidement, en termes donc d'introduction, je voudrais dire seulement que l'initiative Grand Muraille Verte est un projet intégré 
n'est-ce pas, qui propose des actions de lutte contre la désertification, mais qui intègre également la dimension changement climatique et également la biodiversité. Et donc, d'un point de vue historique, nous avons, nous avons euh, de 2005, l'idée était née, et de là, il y a eu la création de l'initiative en 2007 et son endossement par l'Union africaine, la création de l'agence par les 11 États membres, la signature donc, de la Convention et sa ratification. Mais également, nous avons développé euh, une stratégie euh, qui a été évaluée dans le cadre de la première décennie et nous aurons l'occasion également de développer euh, le plan d'investissement prioritaire pour la décennie 2021-2030. Donc, je vais survoler un peu le contexte euh, qui est, comme vous le savez, à, disons, une euh, zone un peu particulière euh, et où il y a du capital naturel. C'est important de, de le comprendre parce que euh, beaucoup de gens pensent que la Grande Muraille Verte, c'est euh, du reboisement, c'est planter des arbres. Mais au-delà de ça, la vision de la Grande Muraille Verte, c'est de créer, n'est-ce pas, des pôles ruraux de production et de développement durable d'où son caractère intégré. Et c'est l'établissement de la viabilité du capital naturel des terroirs. Comme je l'ai dit tantôt, c'est une zone exsangue très difficile parce que c'est une zone saharo-sahélienne par excellence. Et donc, pour lutter contre la désertification, l'initiative entend rétablir donc, euh, le, le capital naturel par la création des pôles ruraux de production et de développement. Euh, quel est le concept Le concept et l'approche, c'est d'abord créer des unités locales qui ont une homogénéité géographique, culturelle, sociale, qui permettent aux populations. Parce que vous savez, euh, quand on veut implémenter la Grande Muraille Verte et qu'on fait des infrastructures, quand on implante des infrastructures, il y a... Euh, des problèmes fonciers qui sont très, très importants et qui sont euh, constatés euh, sur le terrain. C'est dans ce sens que euh, nous avons ce qu'on appelle les usides. Les, les usides, c'est un peu les unités communautaires et intégrées de développement durable. Donc, il faudrait un, un certain nombre de critères. Il faut que ce soit sur le tracé de la Grande Muraille Verte. Il faut avoir cette euh, entité géographique, socio-culturelle qui est prise en compte, mais il y a aussi le capital humain, parce qu'on ne peut pas faire des investissements pour des petites, euh, disons, catégories de population, mais essayer de faire en sorte qu'il y ait une masse critique de population. Mais également, mettre en exergue euh, les opportunités locales de développement. Quelle est l'inclusivité de la gouvernance Nous sommes euh, sous, euh, disons, une gouvernance politique au niveau de l'Union africaine, la CENSAD et les États membres. Mais d'un point de vue opérationnel, nous avons l'agence panafricaine qui joue le rôle d'agence régionale et où il y a au niveau de chacun des pays une structure qu'on appelle agence nationale euh, qui, qui met en œuvre les activités sur le terrain. Et on descend plus bas pour avoir également euh, des, 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 des comités locaux de développement durable qui sont euh, pris en compte parce que le slogan de l'agence, c'est « par les populations et pour les populations ». Et donc, nous avons ce schéma-là, le lucide, effectivement, comme je l'ai dit tantôt, euh, ce n'est pas une approche euh, spécifique, mais c'est une approche globale qui permet d'intégrer le caractère euh, holistique, écosystème, et multisectoriel. Il ne s'agit pas uniquement euh, des ministères en charge des forêts, mais ici on travaille euh, où tous les secteurs qui permettent de, de surmonter un développement économique local, ils sont pris en compte. Et donc c'est un peu ce qu'on appelle donc, les unités communautaires et intégrées de développement durable. Là ici, j'ai pris juste l'exemple du Niger et de la Mauritanie pour dire comment la Grande Muraille Verte se fait on doit arriver à un pôle rural de production et de développement durable. Tu peux avancer, s'il te plaît. Voilà, là, je parlais de, 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 des critères, n'est-ce pas, d'implémentation de la grande muraille verte sur le terrain. Ça veut dire qu'il faut être sur le tracé, avoir une homogénéité géographique, socio-culturelle, 
en tant que capital du masque critique de population et avoir également à exploiter surtout les opportunités locales de développement. Ici, c'est juste un exemple pour montrer de quelle façon on peut, à partir d'un point, d'un pôle, essayer donc de faire en sorte qu'il y ait une multiplication, n'est-ce pas, des pôles ruraux pour en faire un développement intégré in fine. Tu peux avancer, Geoffroy, tu peux avancer. Voilà, là, c'est un peu le caractère de la gouvernance de l'initiative, c'est le niveau politique, donc c'est l'Union africaine, c'est la CENSAT, c'est les États, mais également au niveau régional, c'est l'agence panafricaine. Au niveau national, nous sommes régis par une agence nationale au niveau de chaque pays, et également, donc, à un niveau local où il y a des comités locaux de développement. Tu peux avancer. Voilà, les bénéficiaires, c'est, comme on le dit toujours ici chez nous, c'est par les populations et pour les populations. Voilà, tu peux avancer sur la stratégie. Donc, le, 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 le plan stratégique qu'on avait développé pour la première décennie porte sur un certain nombre donc, de fondamentaux. Et euh, ce sont donc euh, la gestion durable des terres, le changement climatique, le développement socio-économique, la recherche d'accompagnement et développement, les systèmes d'information. C'était un peu les cinq axes stratégiques majeurs qui ont démarré le processus de mise en œuvre de l'initiative. Nous avons une évaluation en 2020 qui nous a permis de faire des réorientations par rapport donc, à ces axes stratégiques majeurs. Tu peux avancer, Geoffroy. Voilà, là je donne ici un peu, si vous voulez, euh, qu'est-ce qui a été fait durant la première décennie. Nous pourrons voir peut-être avec beaucoup plus de, de détails euh, plus tard. Euh, c'est les services sociaux de base, c'est la prise en compte de l'énergie, c'est la prise en compte de l'eau, la question de l'eau. La, la, la question de la reforestation par le reboisement et le suivi, évaluation, n'est-ce pas, de toutes les opérations que nous faisons. On peut avancer rapidement parce qu'il y a encore beaucoup de, 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 de diapos. Voilà, ça c'est la première phase. Je crois qu'on peut aller rapidement. Ici, c'est le, tous tout les aspects de restauration. Ici, c'est euh, la conservation, tout ce qui est changement climatique. On peut aller... Toutes les fondations vont être par euh, aux collègues participants. Là, nous avons juste un modèle qu'on appelle les fermes agricoles communautaires intégrées. Ce schéma-là, je reviens d'une mission, par exemple, euh, il y a cela une semaine. On implémente au fur et à mesure des fermes agricoles communautaires intégrées. Ce n'est pas uniquement des systèmes de production qu'on met en place, mais ces fermes-là, pour arriver au pôle rural de production et de développement durable, nous avons besoin, avec les populations, de développer des petites disons, actions euh, qui vont dans le sens de l'élevage des petits ruminants, parce que c'est à la hauteur de ces populations de surcroît, donc très pauvres. Nous avons également euh, l'aviculture, la pisciculture, tout ce qui peut permettre aux populations d'avoir des revenus très rapidement, à très court terme, sans oublier que l'effet de restauration des terres est un peu le plus important. C'est un peu des cas de fermes agricoles communautaires développées dans les différents pays. Ici, à gauche, c'est le la Mauritanie, à droite, c'est un peu le Niger. On peut avancer, juste pour voir euh, qu'au niveau euh, des différents pays, ici, c'est le Tchad, là, à droite, c'est le Mali, ensuite, le Burkina Faso, le Nigeria, bref, c'est au niveau des différentes populations qu'on mène ces actions-là qui leur permettent surtout d'avoir des de revenus additionnels importants et qui leur par, permettent de participer maintenant à grande échelle à avoir plus d'éléments, euh, plus de participation active, consciente et volontaire. Là, un peu, c'est le bilan de ce qui a été fait durant les dix années au niveau de, à l'échelle de 11 pays. Nous avons créé euh, environ 150 000 euh, emplois directs aux populations. Euh, mais il y a eu beaucoup d'emplois de, de, saisonniers, c'est-à-dire temporaires en fonction donc, de, de, des spéculations. Et il y a surtout les femmes organisées en groupement qui ont permis vraiment de s'organiser. C'est ce qui nous a forme verte des femmes. 
Et surtout, on peut dire que la réduction de l'insécurité alimentaire a été saine. Quelles sont les ressources Nous avons un certain nombre d'instruments, d'outils comme la banque GNV Carbone. Nous avons également un outil qui est le fonds d'adaptation au changement climatique et développement économique local. Mais nous avons également les alliances qui permettent de fédérer, de mutualiser un certain nombre d'éléments. D'autres initiatives, c'est que nous avons en prévision en 2022 de faire un forum économique sur les produits de la Grande Muraille Verte, la plateforme verte des femmes, comme je disais tantôt, mais également la caravane verte des jeunes. Donc, il y a un certain nombre d'initiatives qui sont mises en place et qui permettent donc à une participation active des populations pour réaliser l'initiative. Euh, je crois que tu peux avancer rapidement. Voilà. Ici, c'est important maintenant, c'est pourquoi je disais tantôt dès le début, nous avons un certain nombre d'axes prioritaires ou plutôt de portefeuilles euh, qui sont euh, la gestion durable des terres et développement, euh, aménagement des terres et de la biodiversité comme premier portefeuille. Nous avons le changement climatique et l'économie verte, euh, le développement socio-économique, la sécurité pour la résilience le renforcement des capacités, la communication, ainsi que euh, tout ce qui nous, peut nous permettre de mobiliser le maximum de ressources pour passer à l'échelle. Et à ce niveau, relativement donc à cette euh, disons, collaboration, nous avons signé un accord de coopération avec euh, Bird Life. C'était pour justement régler une question qui est une faiblesse, notamment les aspects biodiversité. J'ai vu, suivi avec beaucoup d'intérêt euh, les présentations qui ont été faites par les collègues tout à l'heure. Justement, en termes de biodiversité, il y a, les, par exemple, tout ce qui est ongulé sauvage qui se développe dans les terroirs de la Grande Muraille Verte. Mais au-delà de ça, nous avons également eu l'occasion, à travers BirdLife, à, à prendre en compte la dimension oiseau. Qui, où on a quand même énormément, énormément de euh, ressources d'oiseaux de, migrateurs qui sont sur la côte sénégal mauritanie qui sont au niveau continental, au niveau du Mali, au niveau du Tchad, à travers le lac Tchad, à travers en tout cas tous les écosystèmes lacustres et fluviaux qui existent et jusqu'à la corne de l'Afrique. Je pense que le projet qu'on est en train de développer avec BirdLife, qui concerne donc cette première portefeuille, c'est notamment la caractérisation des zones humides dans lesquelles ils vivent un certain nombre d'oiseaux qu'il faille donc intégrer et qui jouent un rôle dans justement la mise en œuvre de la Grande Muraille. Alors, les indicateurs par rapport à notre vision 2021-2030, c'est de réaliser 10 millions d'hectares à récupérer et restaurer, c'est de séquestrer 200 millions de tonnes de carbone, c'est de créer 10 millions d'emplois. C'est également... Dr. Goulou, uh, sir, I just want to ask if you can uh, uh, wrap up. I sent you a message. D'accord. D'accord. Très rapidement. Uh, Geoffroy, si tu peux peut-être avancer rapidement. Je crois ce que j'ai dit. Tu peux aller. Ça, c'est ce que j'ai dit déjà. Tu peux aller. Voilà les indicateurs du premier portefeuille. Comme je le disais tantôt, c'est 10 millions d'hectares à récupérer, 250 millions de tonnes de carbone à séquestrer et 10 000 structures de forage, justement les bassins versants, comme je disais. Ça, c'est le premier portefeuille. Deuxième portefeuille, Geoffroy. Geoffroy, tu peux avancer sur le deuxième portefeuille. Voilà, là, c'est le, le, le développement socio-économique. Le développement socio-économique, c'est un peu, tu, tu l'as dépassé, mais bon, ce n'est pas grave. Bref, la, la présentation va permettre aux uns et aux autres d'avoir un document plus élaboré qui leur permettrait donc de voir. Tu peux continuer parce que le temps est, est, est limité. Ça, ce sont les indicateurs du système de suivi qu'on a, qu a mis en place. Et je pourrais finir juste en disant que nous avons fait une planification financière 
où les cinq portefeuilles ont été estimés à à peu près 17 milliards de dollars. Et comme vous le savez, lors du One Planet Summit, il y a eu donc des annonces de financement. Euh, tu peux avancer pour qu'on puisse voir que la communauté internationale, voilà. Là, nous avons les annonces de financement euh, suivant les différents piliers. Le pilier 1 sur les investissements, le pilier 2 sur la restauration, le pilier 3 sur les infrastructures, le pilier 4 sur la gouvernance, le pilier 5 sur euh, euh, le renforcement des capacités, le tout pour euh, environ 19 milliards de dollars qui sont annoncés et où on a mis en place un cadre qu'on appelle accélérateur de sur la Grande Muraille Verte qui est euh, piloté par la, lutte, la Convention des Nations Unies sur la lutte contre la désertification et auquel tous les projets au niveau régional et au niveau des pays vont être soumis au financement de ces différents partenaires qui, sont, euh, qui ont fait des annonces et qui sont listés un peu sur ce, sur ce chemin. En tout cas, je m'excuse beaucoup de tous ces désagréments. C'est un peu ça que je voudrais partager avec vous et je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Well, uh, thank you very much. This was a... Really interesting. Uh, this is the, the, the Great Green Wall is something that is is been on the media uh, recently, and uh, so these two presentations are uh, the first block. So I think uh, we have uh, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, so if you can you, you can send your questions through the question and answers uh, panel at the bottom of the screen. Uh, there is one question uh, which is probably best addressed to uh, to Dr. Sugulu. Uh, there's a question that says, uh, is it possible to get information about exactly where tree planting and other interventions have taken place and what species have been planted? Because we at the RSPB would be interested to look of use of planted areas by residents and migratory birds. So is it possible to get that information? Oui, merci beaucoup. C'est une excellente question. Euh, depuis 2008, euh, nous sommes partis sur la base d'un principe qui dit que qui embrasse trop mal étreint. Euh, L'objectif de la Grande Muraille Verte, c'est effectivement de faire en sorte que euh, les terroirs sahéliens qui sont soumis à, à une vulnérabilité climatique forte soient restaurés. Mais on n'a pas, euh, dès le départ, les moyens nécessaires pour aller euh, trop grand. Il fallait discuter, réfléchir sur où exactement on doit agir d'abord pour freiner la désertification. C'est pour ça que les, les critères de, du tracé de la Grande Muraille Verte qui prend en compte donc, les isoïettes 100 et 400 mm. C'est extrêmement important pour nous. C'est pour éviter qu'on veuille faire des grandes choses alors que les moyens ne suivent pas. Il fallait commencer avec un espace bien circonscrit qu'on appelle le tracé de la Grande Muraille Verte et qui est circonscrit dans l'espace 100-400 mm. Ça correspond sur le terrain, selon les pays, à environ 200 à 300 mm, euh, km pardon, sur, le, sur, le terrain, sur le terrain, en termes de largeur. Comme vous le savez, le kilomètre, mais à l'intérieur de chaque pays, les isoïdes font à peu près 200 à 250, voire 300 km sur le terrain de largeur. La deuxième chose, c'est que depuis 2008, nous avons caractérisé environ 200 espèces végétales qui sont à même d'être implémentées. Ce sont des espèces végétales qui sont adaptées, réellement adaptées. Un travail de fourmi a permis, donc, et vous pouvez avoir ces informations-là, on peut, sur le premier tome qui existe déjà sur le site de la Grande Muraille Verte, pour dire que ces espèces-là, euh, sont les espèces qui sont adaptées au mieux au terroir sahélien de la Grande Muraille Verte. 
Deuxièmement, troisièmement plutôt, par rapport aux populations. Effectivement, les populations sont la cible réelle. Et actuellement, je crois que pourquoi on fait de la Grande Muraille Verte un modèle dans l'actualité, comme l'a dit le collègue Tanto, c'est parce qu'effectivement, quand vous venez sur le terrain, par rapport aux premières réalisations qui sont faites, ce sont les populations qui sont au devant de la scène. C'est ça l'originalité. Aujourd'hui, on parle d'un modèle achevé parce qu'effectivement, les populations sont mises au devant. Et l'approche la, la, qu'on a développée, qui consiste à permettre aux populations d'avoir un minimum, parce que euh, les populations de terroirs sahéliens ne sont pas comme celles qui, qui vivent dans les forêts. Ici, c'est la, la difficulté, c'est la précarité. Et donc, l'approche Grand Muraille Verte, qui est à la fois multisectorielle, qui est à la fois écosystémique et inclusive, permet à ces populations d'être les vraies actrices de la mise en œuvre. Aujourd'hui, on peut dire que, globalement, l'approche, elle est internalisée. Aujourd'hui, tout le monde, toutes les populations des zones qui ne sont pas encore en activité, souhaitent que les projets viennent se développer pour qu'elles puissent avoir dans le court terme, des revenus additionnels pour qu'ils puissent y vivre d'abord et ensuite participer aux grandes actions de restauration, de reboisement, de mise en défense, de régénération naturelle assistée. D'où l'originalité de notre, de notre modèle. Et nous pensons que nous avons, après dix ans, maîtrisé l'approche et nous sommes dans une phase de mise à l'échelle actuellement. Avec tous les financements qui sont annoncés, dans le cadre de l'accélérateur, nous pensons que la mise à l'échelle de Dakar à Djibouti va se faire de manière aisée. D'où les indicateurs qu'on a fixés pour 2030, notamment les 100 millions, 100 millions de restauration de terres, de terres à récupérer et restaurer, les 10 millions d'emplois à créer. Ce sont des indicateurs qui sont fixés par rapport à cette seconde décennie qui s'annonce. Merci en tout cas pour cette question-là. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Avakar. Uh, I think we uh, will have to move on to the to the next block. I want to thank uh, Amy Frankel, Jack Vie, and Avakar Spuru for their presentation. And we are going to move now to mobilizing stakeholders. We're going to start Aimee, with the Carlos Carboneras, who's going to be talking about the Turtle Dove Action Plan. For those who, who don't know me, I'm Carlos Carboneras. I work as a program manager for the, for the Migrants Program at RSPB, the international side of that program. I'm currently based in Spain at the um, Institute of Game and Wildlife uh, Research, um, implementing a, a contract, which I'll describe in a minute. Um, this talk will be on the experience of um, implementing uh, a species action plan, what happens next after uh, the plan has been uh, adopted. So I assume people will be familiar with the European turtle dove. This is a, a globally threatened species currently vulnerable under IUCN. Um, there's uh, some examples here of uh, uh, on the map is two examples of the same data showing the route, the migratory uh, route of the Western flyway uh, because the species has two my, uh, migration flyways to migration routes uh, across Europe. This is the Western Flyway, confusingly because we talk about the East Atlantic, uh, but for in terms of total of, uh, this is the Western Flyway, which goes all the way down from the United Kingdom, uh, the Netherlands, Germany, and then through France, uh, Iberia, Morocco, and then into the wintering areas in the, in the Sahel zone that we've just um, heard of. Um, listed here are the multiple factors um, that are um, <clears throat> that contribute to the widespread decline. Um, in summary, these are due to uh, loss of habitat or loss of quality of habitat, both on the breeding grounds and on the wintering grounds. And crucially on migration, there is a big issue of unsustainable hunting, which leads to uh, low survival. 
Um, the International Species Action Plan was developed. Uh, it was, it was uh, developed by the RSPB um, through a very wide consultation, participation of about 300 experts and stakeholders from over 50 countries. So uh, a very uh, important sort of shared um, uh, initiative that produced this action plan, which is a recommendation, it's not compulsory. Um, and crucially, it included a moratorium on hunting starting in, in 2018, <clears throat> excuse me, which was, um, which was, which, which was not implemented. It, it, no country, no uh, EU member state that, um, that signed up to the agreement um, actually uh, took on this moratorium. So I will be uh, focusing on the adaptive harvest management. Um, there are issues it's linked with the conservation of breeding and wintering habitats. And then uh, there was also some emergency feeding schemes proposed by the plan. I would say that the plan was funded by the European Commission and it was adopted by EU member states, but also the same plan was adopted under CMS for the non-EU part of the range. So it, uh, it does uh, comprise the entire uh, flyway, the entire distribution range um, of the species. Um, when we, uh, we develop uh, when we go into adaptive harvest management, AHM stands for adaptive harvest management, uh, which was the chosen management tool for uh, the turtle dove, for the hunting of turtle dove. Uh, the first thing to, to do is to agree on a population objective. This has been done already in 2021. We have, um, we have, we have crossed that bridge and we now have a formulated population objective, uh, which is that by 2018, so in, the, in, in these sorry, 2028, in this 10 year um, duration of the plan, we will have achieved uh, a positive growth of the population through this flyway Peckham's index. Um, I, I won't describe that, we don't have time, but just to say that we need positive growth, the population needs to recover. Um, the, the range, the distribution range needs to be maintained there has to be enough habitat available and it has to be properly managed. And this has to, um, we, we need to ensure that this happens across the entire flyway because obviously uh, for these migratory species, we need to make sure that there is enough conservation, um, enough habitat and enough uh, safe travel uh, throughout the, their, their entire life cycle, their entire annual cycle. Um, when they fly through several countries, going through several um, um, several situations, um, this is a representation of the same objective. The the sort of the the, the positive growth, uh, an example with real data on where we were um, historically. The 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 black dot shows the historical trend. Anything that is below one means decline. So that historically, the decline has been quite severe, quite generalized, quite widespread. Um, in the last 10 years, the situation is not as bad, but equally negative growth and therefore population decline. And the objective is to have by 2028, we need to be <laughs> above that line. We need to be <laughs> on positive growth. <laughs> is that somebody laughing? Um, now, our modeling shows we've done uh, as part of the contract that we are um, implementing, um, we uh, have developed some, some modeling that shows that um, it all depends on survival. Survival is the critical um, aspect um, uh, for the conservation of this species. So these are two representations of the same sort of um, outputs from the model that shows that current uh, hunting levels are unsustainable. And if we remove hunting from the population, the population will start to recover. So if you look at the, at the green um, uh, line here, it's the only one where the harvest is zero. So with zero harvest, the population would remain stable or, or increase slightly with the current levels of survival and productivity. Any take, any harvest um, 
produces the, the consequence uh, of that will be population decline. And this what's convinced the European Commission uh, to push for a, a, a hunting ban, which has been, um, which was our recommendation and it has been implemented in uh, starting in 2021. So um, acting as the, the consortium that led, um, that, that uh, developed this contract under the European Commission, uh, the consortium is acting as the scientific advisory group. And our recommendation was that for at least for four years, starting in 2021, there had to be zero harvest along the entire flyway, along the entire Western flyway. We expected that as a result of that, there would be increased abundance, therefore more birds around. around. Um, those birds would survive better because obviously you remove a source of mortality and crucially we needed more, not less, habitat management and this was directed to the member states and all the authorities, uh, the competent authorities in the countries, including range states for CMS, they need to make sure that they do their bit by providing uh, good quality habitat. We've covered 2021. Um, this is the uh, so this has been the first part, the first year when we have been implementing the contract. We have achieved a big, a very significant goal, which is that uh, in 2021, no hunting has occurred legally in the Western Flyway. That means removing hunting from such difficult countries as France, Spain, and Portugal. Um, we have also developed a, a proposal on governance, uh, which was developed by the European Commission. So now we have something to build on and, and start putting in place. And also crucially, national authorities in both EU and non-EU countries need to uh, work on a number of issues, developing reg regulatory mechanisms, um, deciding on internal port allocations, and, and also to make sure that they have systems in place to control hunting if it ever uh, or when it potentially uh, comes back because uh, as part of adaptive harvest management we do not uh, remove hunting forever we just manage hunting so that it uh, it, it represents a sustainable um, extraction of uh, parts of the population but without damaging the the long-term survival of that population um, Luckily, we don't end here. Uh, the contract with the European Commission that is being developed by um, IREC and other uh, research agencies, um, this contract has been extended, which means that for 2022, we will be in a similar position. We will continue to act as the scientific advisory group and our jobs will be to update all the scientific data and provide um, indices and, and uh, update the modeling and make sure that we have all the information. Uh, we will crucially develop simulations of population trajectories like the one uh, I've shown you under different management scenarios. Um, and um, it will be important to monitor progress made by the, uh, the member states um, and the, the, the national authorities, the competent authorities um, to make sure that they develop, they implement the, the actions that are contained in the action plan, and also they submit uh, the information. And as stated here, um, this is an ongoing process. Uh, it will uh, uh, repeat itself. The ne next iteration will be in 23 and 24, and, and throughout the duration of the Species Action Plan, uh, there will be so annual iterations in which uh, obviously, um, and I'm proud to say this, bird life partners have taken part, um, it, nearly all uh, uh, bird life partners along the flyway, um, including European and also non-European part um, of the distribution. They uh, took part in the process. They are part of the, of the process as are on the other side, um, are the other stakeholders, hunters, uh, etc. Um, regional, local and national uh, authorities and we acting as that scientific advisory group sort of driving, uh, uh, driving the show and, and trying to make sure that we have all the information and uh, whenever 
a decision is made is made with the best uh, with the best knowledge available. I think that's all. I uh, don't know if there will be some time for questions uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Excellent. Uh, very interesting presentation and uh, very uh, impressive to see the, the number of stakeholders that you have mobilized and the level of stakeholders that you have managed to, to mobilize. There will be some time for questions when at the end of the block. So we'll move on first to a couple of uh, brief presentations. One is uh, just now uh, Sviatoslav Valasiuk from the Polish Society of the Protection of Birds. Uh, will give us an update uh, on a meeting that just took place earlier this week uh, and the biogeographical workshop on migratory birds and uh, special protected areas in Europe. So uh, Slava, the floor is yours. And don't forget to put your questions in the question and answer uh, space. Uh, you can access it at the bottom of the, of, of, of the screen. Thank you for giving the floor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Svetoslav Kolosyuk. I represent the Polish Society for the Protection of Birds, uh, acting as a, a regional hub of IFI for the Baltic Sea countries. Well, starting uh, under the auspices of the EU biogeographical process, a series of networking events is taking place. More than 30 experts representing the European Commission, national governments, institution, Bird Life Ground Partners, other NGOs and academia from eight countries assembled this week for the second event in the range, covering the part of the East Atlantic flyway over overlapping with the Atlantic and continental biogeographical realms in order to prioritize their country's special protected areas important for migration and develop the roadmap of joint activities aiming at protection of migratory birds along the East Atlantic flyway. A list of live priority migratory species, as well as a set of quantitative and qualitative criteria were used to select sites able to provide the highest return on the EU funded investment in the form of improving the state of migratory species and achieving the strategy 2030 goals. The success of the previous Baltic networking event was partly reproduced as the experts from Great Britain and Germany have managed to shortlist the priority sites in their countries. For the rest of the countries, the selection process revealed some data and methodological flaws which impeded immediate obtaining of the desired results and will be fixed in the following up, follow up phase in order to complete the assessment exercise. An innovative GIS embedded species based approach of determining the key wet grasslands, including those lying outside the existing Natura and Emerald networks, was demonstrated, uh, which will help to fill in the gap, uh, data gaps. Despite all the challenges, the participants admitted the insightful character of the event, which demonstrated the possible ways forward for the flyway relevant activities and the entire process. The representatives of the EC Directorate General for environment have welcomed the uh, bird life work on prioritizing special protected areas for migratory birds sake. They said they saw the possibility that this work would feed into the policy work of the EU biodiversity strategy and stated that with further development of the two methods used at the workshop, member states could have feedback from East Atlantic Flyway Initiative and their national action plans for, for the European Commission's restoration program. The contribution of the Birdwatch Ireland, which hosted the event, was acknowledged. BWI, being a partner to East Atlantic Flyway Initiative, proved useful in terms of supporting the capacity of the organization in increasing the network relationship, especially with RSPB Northern Ireland colleagues. BWI look forward to soon become a flyway hub for the Atlantic and West Continental part of the flyway. Many thanks. Many thanks, Slava. It's uh, very interesting. This uh, last uh, uh, is just a, a brief update of uh, what was a very interesting uh, meeting uh, earlier this week. We're going to give the floor now to uh, João Bello. João Bello is uh, ambassador for the East Atlantic Flyway Youth Forum, which took place uh, last month. So, João, if if you're ready, please, yeah, the floor is yours. Okay, guys, everyone is listening to me? 
Yeah. So, hi, my name is João, and I'm the ambassador of the East Atlantic Flyway Youth Forum. Uh, I'm here to present the main concept and uh, the keynotes of the forum. Next slide, please. So the forum was held on last September and recounted with the presence of uh, many young people from different countries along the East Atlantic Flyway and other flyways also. Uh, and we counted also with the presence of uh, the partner organizations. The main goal of, the, um, of this forum is to set the scene for intergenerational uh, communication, collaboration and discussion after the forum between uh, young people, between young people. Next slide, please. So during the forum, we had the opportunity of uh, uh, having different activities. We started with networking sessions where each person could introduce uh, himself or herself uh, and get to know each other and got to know also the work of uh, each other. Then we had several presentations from uh, youth and from uh, the partner organizations who currently work on uh, wetland conservation and uh, water and the migratory water work conservation. Uh, we also discussed uh, future collaboration through brainstorming activities between uh, young people and also the advisors and the partner organizations. And we finished by activating through the ambassadors program. Next. Next slide, please. So the ambassadors are a group of 12 young people uh, spread out through different countries uh, of the East Atlantic Flyway from north to south. Um, the main goal of the ambassadors is to keep the Flyaway youth connected through uh, digital platforms and uh, through forums like the, the one that was held last month. Uh, through collaborations, discussions, also communication. And uh, we will have, the 12 ambassadors will have uh, the three main tasks. The first one is to draft the forum declaration, which will be addressed to all young people that want to take action in the conservation of wetlands, but also, to, uh, also will be addressed to stakeholders. Then we will also uh, draft the Flyaway Youth Action Plan, from 21 to 22 uh, for this year, uh, which will have several activities that the young people will develop. We are going to develop with the objective of engaging more young people uh, in uh, this common interest, the flyway. And we will also act as spokesperson for this Atlantic flyway after the forum um, in a conference, webinars, and uh, yeah. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, the main messages of the, the forum was that this will happen more times. Uh, we, will, uh, um, we will ensure that there are uh, the, the digital platforms needed for young people continued communication, but also communication with other uh, with the stakeholders and partner organizations. Uh, there is uh, one conclusion also was that there is an urgent need of intergenerational cooperation in the decision making process and many young people are here to actively participate and contribute. Uh, but for this to happen, we need the support of the partner organizations, both in knowledge and in resources, so that we can increase the opportunities for young people along the way. Next slide, please. And yeah, thank you very much for having me. I, was, I also want to thank for the organizers of the, the forum, which was a really interesting initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Rao. It's uh, really, really nice to have you here and uh, to have the, the youth represented uh, in, in, in this meeting. Uh, we have time, uh, a little bit of time for uh, one or two questions. So uh, there's a question for Carlos coming from Thomas Lemberg. Uh, from Dolph, which says, Carlos, how well known is the preferred habitats of the turtle dove along the flyway? Is this governing the habitat management you told us is taking place through the flyway? Um, so yes, um, part of the work that we're delivering um, is a review of um, habitat associations um, throughout the entire breeding range, uh, so uh, across Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, that shows that um, unlike um, in some countries, 
the what the species prefers, the preferred habitat is the ecotone between uh, farmland and woodland, and and it it doesn't prefer any of uh, any of those, but a combination. So where it occurs on farmland, uh, it is more abundant in places where farmland has some woodland elements, and the other way around. It's never in in, in, in closed forests. It it, it needs uh, no understory. Um, so open forest, uh, op open uh, open canopy, and uh, yeah, we, we're going to publish this soon um, and make it available to everybody. There's a question for Joao, which is uh, in, in in the chat, but maybe you can comment on it. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, the countries, uh, I don't know them all. Uh, but uh, we have people from, I'm starting from north down south, so we have people from Netherlands, from France, from Portugal, which is me, uh, from Sen Senegal, from um, Zambia, from Angol Angola. Um, yeah, and uh, I think I'm missing two countries, I don't remember now. But yeah, that's, uh, we are uh, very, very spread across the flow. Okay, and uh, our last question before we move to the next section is, does the ban, this is also for Carlos, does the ban in Europe is going to affect Africa? Um, so, um, not directly. Um, we are uh, doing this in much in the framework of the European Commission and the, the European Commission can um, is the guardian of the birds directive that only applies uh, within um, the European Union. So that's where the, it can be effective. Um, other countries are encouraged to so non EU countries are encouraged not to allow hunting, um, especially since some countries are making an effort. And it is crucial that um, a lot of the um, hunting tourism is done by citizens of EU countries who go to, especially North Africa, to do the things that they cannot do at home. So that is a sort of a responsibility uh, that we are aware of. And we, we're trying to make sure that the competent authorities uh, try to tackle that. Um, let, yeah, it's, it's a gradual process, but I think it's a good start. So um, every year in um, France, Spain and Portugal alone, there, there were 1.1 million turtle doves shot out of a population of, of around 5 million. So um, if we can reduce that, uh, it will it's bound to have a big impact through improving, uh, increasing survival, which as I showed was the key factor. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, well, there's there's other questions. We'll see if at the end of the in, in the at, at the end there's a bit of space. If we have a bit of time, we can we can tackle additional questions. But I think uh, as we're a little bit behind, we should move now to uh, the, the the next section, which is about the uh, the small actions to support the conservation of uh, shorebirds in the African portion of the East Atlantic Flyway. This is something that has been stimulated by the East Atlantic Flyway Initiative, BirdLife's East Atlantic Flyway Initiative. So uh, I'm going to invite first uh, our colleagues from uh, Grepom. So that's a BirdLife partner, partner in, in Morocco. We have with us today Khadija Bouras and Asma Wasu. Uh, they're going to tell us about the Larash salt pans and the and about the, the project itself that they have been implemented. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jaime. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Khadija Boras, the Executive Director of uh, Grepon BirdLife Morocco. I will present uh, one of our major conservation project, rehabilitation of salt pans uh, of Larash in um, northern of Morocco. Um, this project uh, is located at the estuary of uh, the Wedlo Coast, one uh, on the Atlantic coast of northern Morocco. Uh, the total surface where uh, we intervened in about 40 hectares, shown uh, in yellow uh, in the map. And uh, we should note that 
It, this is only a part of the salt pans, the majority of which are abandoned. Uh, the salt pans are one of uh, the habitat components of the lower locust wetland complex, along with uh, freshwater marshes and uh, other habitats. The whole complex is classified as a SIB and the ABA and the uh, Ramsar site. Uh, in their heyday, salt pans uh, were occupying a much larger area north, north of the yellow area. Uh, but started to become gradually abandoned, uh, abandoned more than two decades ago. So this created a multifaceted uh, problem. And here we show what we this problem are and how we tried to solve them, them with this project. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, in a nutshell, salt pans abandonment created socioeconomic problem uh, represented by a loss of local employment and with it a loss of generation old know-how. Uh, the abandonment also had a negative ecological um, consequence uh, once invaded by a vegetation as shown in the two photos at the very beginning of the restoration, uh, the salt pans become unsuitable for weathers and other wetland bird as a watering and stopover area. Uh, Thank you. Uh, in these uh, two photos, we can see the state of different parts of the salt pans uh, when they were abandoned. Uh, the crystallization basin became completely flat as shown above on the, for, on the foreground, and even the pumping station was reduced to rinse here in, below. Next slide, please. The objectives of our project are the what we can achieve to reserve or stop the problem caused by salt pans abandonment highlighted in the previous previous slides. And uh, this has naturally ecological and socioeconomic component. Uh, in the next few slides, I will show more photos. Um, uh, next slide, please. I will show um, more photo documenting the site before and during the abandonment, as uh, well as photo taken during the restoration project. In this way, I will show the main results of our project in more natural way. Um, this photo was taken in uh, April. 2002, when the salt pans were still functioning, uh, a good habitat for waters and other birds. And this one uh, taken in 2016, 14 years after the cessation of uh, salt pans production. The salt pans become practically useless, no salt and no birds. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, this group of photos was taken during the execution of uh, our project from, from the creation of a cooperative in which Grepom is also a member. Uh, photo below is uh, logo in the middle. The actual restoration works. Uh, to the day, the water ran through the salt pans again. Button in right, right button. Uh, ne next. The first result is the reception of salt production at the site as shown in this photo taken in December 2018. Next slide, please. And here we can see uh, that the birds started to re reuse the site as well. Next slide, please. Uh, with that, uh, without in enumerating every challenge faced before and during the project execution, we will cite here just one, the COVID-19 pandemic. We think this is the major challenge. COVID-19 came at the wrong time when salt production was just starting, and this caused and still caused numerous problems from uh, work at the salt pans to the commercialization of salt. Nice. Next. Uh, to overcome this and go beyond, we have some short and medium to long goals. Uh, in short term, we help to cooperate, uh, cooperative negative to 
navigate the COVID-19 pandemic in order to continue their work at the self defense despite the difficult challenges and uh, strengthening the cooperative so they become fully independent and sustainable, restore more abandonment the salt plants and consider the restoration of other salt plants such as those uh, at Sprezima. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Khadija. Now we're going to have uh, Asma, I suppose. Thank you, Jaime. So hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Asma Ouassou from um, Grip on Bird Life Morocco. And I'm going to present a second project of Grip on Bird Life Morocco that is funded by the East Atlantic Flyway Initiative small grant. So um, this project has been developed in the context of the East Atlantic Flyway Initiative partnership to contribute to improving the conservation status of important sites and habitats for migratory shorebirds, especially since uh, one out of every four shorebird species in the East Atlantic Flyway is globally threatened or near threatened. Next, please. So in Morocco, Atlantic coastal wetlands are important wintering and resting areas for several shorebird species along this flyway. Many of them have declined in recent decades. Next, please. So our project it aims to improve knowledge on four different species of sandpipers, identify and assess natural and anthropogenic disturbance factors, and finally develop a multi-species action plan for their conservation. Next, please. So the four species targeted by our project have different ecological requirements and are all wintering and passage migrants in Morocco. Here you can see their average wintering numbers for the last decade between 2011 and 2020. They are all near threatened and declining globally and also in Morocco based on trend analysis of wintering numbers, except for the wimbrel. Next, please. <clears throat> These four species are observed in different wetlands, as you can see on the map, but with greater numbers in coastal areas. We've identified three key wintering and stopover wetlands in the north, center and south, to enhance our knowledge on their use by the shorebirds and the pressures they undergo. And this is, of course, in order to implement appropriate conservation measures. Next, please. So this project is implemented by GREPOM, but is, is supported by VBN, but other stakeholders are also involved and are crucial to its success, notably the Water and Forestry Department and local NGOs. Next, please. So set to be completed by July 2022, the project consists of five main activities, three of which are already in progress, mainly a completed literature review of the species hosting sites, the study of their habitats used in three representative wetlands, which consist of field missions during autumn, winter and spring, and the assessment of the losses and transformations of the wetlands habitats, which needs, in addition to field missions, a cartography of the habitat's temporal and spatial evolution over 20 years. Next, please. So to sum up our progress in the project, a report on the, dis on the distribution and numbers of the four species is almost finalized. Three key sites have been identified. <coughs> and field missions have been undertaken during the spring of 2020, but during which uh, the Hnifis Lagoon in the south couldn't be visited due to, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, technical uh, difficulties uh, related to COVID especially. And uh, other field missions have also been undertaken during this autumn uh, for the three sites. Finally, the recruitment of a cartographer is in progress. Next, please. Now that's uh, what's after the completion of this project. Well, first and foremost, we'll need to guarantee and work with the different stakeholders to mobilize necessary resources to ensure the implementation of the multi-species action plan. Besides this project, as you know, is but a first step in a long conservation and management process that we serve as a basis for other conservation projects on other sites and also on other species. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Asma. Uh, I think we're going to move on to the, and, and, and Hadija as well, and we're going to move on to the next presentation. So we have some short presentation, first by uh, Francisco Wambar, the director of uh, Odyssey H, which is the, an organization in, in Guinea-Bissau, monitoring avifauna in the Mansoa River Basin. So okay. Uh, saying, um, bonjour à tous, merci à tous, et merci pour uh, cette invitation. Uh, je crois que on peut commencer par uh, cette présentation. OK. Uh, je m'appelle Francisco Gomez Vambar. Je suis directeur exécutif de l'ODGH Guinée-Bissau. OK. On travaille avec uh, VBN et Everlife dans un projet de monitoring de uh, Bailarica Pavonina et Limosa Limosa à Mansoa, qui inclut éducation environnementale et la participation de communautés locales sur la conservation. OK. Attention. OK. Merci. Euh, OK. La présentation s'appelle euh, « La vifonde aptique de, de bassin de rivière Massoa ». OK. Autour des dernières quatre années, on a donné importance à la monitorisation et suivi des oiseaux et leurs habitats dans différents zikos qui sont au pays. On est dix zikos, mais on travaille fortement dans trois. Euh, dans cette ZICO, on promouve la situation communautaire, la communauté locale sur la protection et la conservation des oiseaux migratrices à travers l'éducation environnementale. Dans le cadre des autres projets, on travaille aussi avec les activités génératrices de revenus avec les communautés. En cas spécial de ce projet, qui est financé par VBN, qui ont reçu le soutien de Life Secrétaire Dakar. On travaille sur la suivi de Limosa, Limosa et Bailarica Ponina avec six communautés locales. Par exemple, Njugal, Kusana, Kusenj, Patiala, Uche et Chukudur. Euh, Les cibles dans ce projet, comme vous le savez, sont des espèces comme Balérica Pauvenina, qui est vulnérable au niveau mondial. On peut regarder la liste rouge de Wissen. Aussi, Limosa Limosa, vulnérable au niveau de l'Europe et menacée globalement. Ce sont deux diapos qu'on vous regarde des photos. Euh, à droite et de espèces. Non, pas pour quel Pour quel on va Ok. C'est un bassin composé par différents. Euh, ça fait partie d'un IBAS GW002. Il y a une superficie de 13 000 hectares couverte par différents euh, euh, écosystèmes. La partie nord-ouest, on trouve plus d'écosystèmes de mangroves et des autres écosystèmes de zones humides. Quand on la partie nord-ouest par la partie nord-ouest, on trouve aussi différents types d'écosystèmes de zones humides. Dans la partie nord-ouest, comme j'ai dit, on va trouver plus l'écosystème de zones humides de eau douce, euh, où ces espèces sont euh, qu'on a pendant le monitoring, on a, on a trouvé beaucoup des espèces comme on va regarder. À, Euh, à 
attention, attention, retournez un peu. Ok, dans ces zones, par exemple, dans ces zones, on trouve la grande concentration de limosa limosa, un cas particulier en Guinée-Bissau, de Baïta Pavonina en Guinée-Bissau. C'est une seule zone où on trouve plus nombre de, de, des individus. Comme euh, je vous dis, si on sort la part nord, nord-ouest, ici c'est la part nord-ouest de la région où on trouve l'écosystème euh, de zone humide de eau douce. On avance. Allez-y, ok. Ok, l'espèce de lavéfaune trouvée. On trouve ici 50 espèces différentes de la bifone, principalement de eau douce. Et pendant huit mois de suivi des oiseaux, on a trouvé 37 558 vidéos. Mois de monitoring de cette zone. Bon, L'espèce. Oui. Sorry. Uh, the, the, we... Will you take the time? OK, OK. L'espèce... Uh, uh, you can wrap up, sont, sont, uh, um, Comment on dit? Uh, on trouve beaucoup d'espèces, uh, 24 espèces de oiseaux migratrices. Le reste sont des oiseaux uh, résidents, uh, des autres migratrices, des autres que, que font la reproduction à la um, acide. OK. Ici, on trouve l'espèce euh, ciblée, Limosa Limosa. Comme vous savez, on trouve euh, 3213 individus. Euh, ici, Balerica Pavonina, 3, 3 de la population mondiale. Euh, 456 individus qui étaient trouvés dans le période de monitoring. Ici, eh, Grariora, Pretincolis, ça se trouve dans ces zones. Ici, euh, on trouve ici, par, par, par exemple, l'état de conservation de Par exemple, c'est une ibos, mais euh, très important pour les le deux espèces, mais qui n'a pas un statut de conservation. C'est un problème. Euh, il est zico, mais il n'est pas un statut de conservation. OK, ici, on travaille avec l'éducation environnementale, avec la local et aussi la communauté locale. 12 personnes participent à la monitoring de cette espèce à la zone de Rivière-Massau. Et ce sont de, les gens qui participent dans ce, de, de ce processus, la communauté locale et notre technicien. Allez-y. OK, merci. Ce sont des choses qu'on avait présentées pour, pour, on avait pour vous uh, présenter. Merci. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco. Very interesting. Uh, I'm going to move quickly to the next presentation to the Estuarine Habitat Rehabilitation Project in the Burke River. This is in South Africa. And we have Gisela Morrison for this to tell us. Gisela, floor is yours. Thank you very much. With the East Atlantic Flyways Initiative support, BirdLife South Africa is undertaking a project to pilot erosion mitigation interventions at the Burke River Estuary located on South Africa's west coast. And next slide, please. The Burke River Estuary is one of the country's most important estuaries for conservation, comprising a range of threatened estuarine vegetation types and supporting rich bird life. Uh, in the summer, the estuary regularly supports tens of thousands of non pastoral water birds, with numbers strongly influenced by the influx of Paleartic migrants. The intertidal mudcats here and the commercial salt sands, when well managed, um, support the highest density of waders at this estuary. Next slide, please. The Burke faces serious threats, um, including increasing bank feeder stabilization, erosion, and uh, sedimentation, which impacts viral habitat. And human interference has contributed considerably to this including the permanent opening of the mouth, uh, bridge construction and bank site development. And upstream infrastructure has reduced 
fresh water inflow considerably. And during the recent drought, hypersaline conditions caused significant die off of the Phragmites weed marsh in the area, which further destabilized banks. Um, and wave action from both and wind also accelerates erosion in places. And next slide, please. So the project employs a, a multi pronged partnership approach, including objectives around uh, monitoring, integration with local policy, information and regulatory signage, trialing soft engineering erosion control techniques, including estuarine habitat rehabilitation, and job creation and training. And next slide, please. So our project makes use of established monitoring schemes as well as instituting new. Um, so that means carrying out vegetation surveys. Uh, next, please. We also do measures of bank loss, uh, flow velocity and water quality, as well as all third and bathymetric surveys. So the project has facilitated the construction of barriers to prevent a vehicle movement in erosion sensitive areas. Um, zone bird sanctions and erosion mitigation measures were also successfully included into the recreational bylaw, and both informational and regulatory signage have been erected. The project is also trialing bank size habitat rehabilitation techniques, sorry, next piece, which will inform the management framework. And next slide, please. So, erosion sites were identified to pilot these techniques. And we began with weed marsh rehabilitation in areas affected by the recent drought. You can go through the next few feet. Um, these photos illustrate weed marsh recovery one year after landscaping and weed planting. And the second stage of the trial involves using vegetated geocells to stabilize banks. The project is also providing training new techniques as well as creating jobs. Uh, last slide, please. I would just like to thank um, Bernard Lackey for funding this important initiative, um, as well as all our partners in the project. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Giselle. Well, I would invite then uh, Julia to to present. She's uh, the executive director of BirdLife Zimbabwe. She will tell us some of the things that they have been doing there. Julia, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, greetings from Zimbabwe. I'm just going to give an overview of uh, some of the work that we are doing that um, positively impacts uh, migratory species, bird species. Um, um, so next slide, please. And a little bit of who we are. We are the BirdLife International Partner in Zimbabwe. Next slide, please. So we are very heavily involved in vulture conservation work, uh, particularly in the development of vulture safe zones. Uh, this map, it's a bit small, but if you zoom it, you can see um, the vulture safe zones that we are developing um, and uh, the potential ones at this point in time. Uh, it doesn't, uh, um, we've got the whole of the north um, west area of Zimbabwe, the, uh, along the Zambezi River, that's also um, potential vulture safe zones that is not on this map. But these are the current areas that we are working around. Um, we've also got a transboundary uh, working with Bird Life Botswana and Bird Watch Zambia uh, in the Kavango Zambezi um, Transfrontier Conservation Area, uh, looking at uh, poisoning, uh, addressing poisoning issues. These affect, obviously affect um, also, not only the vultures, but um, migratory species. We get steps eagles, the big eagles, lesser spotted eagles, uh, European honey buzzards, uh, common buzzards. Um, I wanted to say that as Zimbabwe, we are signatories to the Ramsar Convention, the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Iowa. Iowa. And um, so we are very uh, aware, um, you know, of the positive impacts of um, conservation, tackling conservation at landscape level. Next slide, please. One of the critical issues, and I think all of us, I don't know that we've spoken a lot about it, is involving local communities uh, in conservation action. Uh, we also are engaged um, with projects 
uh, in terms of belief-based practices that are also affect uh, migratory species, especially the eagles. Um, in Zimbabwe, we call it the muti trade. Um, so vultures are trapped um, for uh, traditional healers practices, and and um, we are looking at the extent. Uh, and it's pretty much opening a can of worms. And it's not just, uh, you know, iconic species, vultures. We're particularly looking at vultures, but it's all species across um, the, the range. Um, so involving local uh, stewardship, uh, particularly in important bird and biodiversity areas, but uh, in other areas as well. Next slide, please. Um, a big um, project that we're working on in Zimbabwe is wetlands, uh, particularly in Harare. Harare is not an important bird and biodiversity area or key biodiversity area, which is unfortunate uh, because it's headwater wetlands. We built our capital city on headwater wetlands. Um, so indicator species are migratory species that we work with, striped crakes, cheeky bested blufftails, um, and uh, Particularly, we are focused in Narari, but not only even in rural wetlands, but in Narari, particularly because there's all the decision makers and the policy makers are here. So we do a lot of advocacy um, with local authorities and government and Ministry of Environment and local government and Ministry of Finance. Um, because as in many countries in Africa, Zimbabwe is on a development trajectory that is, uh, we are desperate to develop. And uh, so where are we developing and, and are we taking into account the environment? So wetlands are critically and something that I think we need to mention more, uh, especially in terms of Southern Africa, is climate change. We are drying up. So water is a big, big issue, not only for people uh, and development you know, uh, projections for, for Zimbabwe, but uh, birds. Um, next slide, please. So what we do is with government, we're working on tools for the protection of wetlands. So development of uh, wetland uh, master plans, where are the wetlands, where are the species, uh, development of national guidelines and national wetland policies for the protection of these areas. Next slide, please. And of course, education. Uh, children are incredibly fun to work with. And they are really interested in birds and migratory species, which are also very fascinating uh, to them. Of course, at this, uh, this time of the year, we've got lots of migratory species coming in and the children, uh, think, uh, thankfully, uh, our COVID restrictions, COVID-19 restrictions have eased and so schools are back and we are engaging with schools extensively. Next slide, please. Another uh, aspect, we've got a bird life youth clubs. Uh, they're also engaged uh, in, in our Ramsar sites in addressing issues that also affecting um, uh, many of our dams, and that is gillnet fishing, artisanal fishing. So gillnets are uh, a huge problem uh, over many of our dams that are um, and, and are affecting wader species. So the bird in the photograph is not a migratory species, it's a gray-headed gull, but I, I couldn't find a photograph, but they're all affected. Uh, just uh, in the timeline that I, I needed to find a photograph, I couldn't find one. So, but this is, the, it's, it's, it's a big problem because they um, walk along the shoreline and uh, um, are caught in these uh, very cheap um, gill nets. Uh, that are abandoned by fishermen. Next slide, please. So preservation of wetlands also in the rural areas. We've got a project running in Drupanthe grasslands, important bird and biodiversity area. It's also a Ramsar site, very, very important. Uh, with community engagement, we are de developing livelihoods to stop encroachment of um, villages and people onto the uh, wetlands, and um, um, particularly for cranes. Um, but um, many other migratory species. Um, um, harriers, I put a photograph of harriers because we get many harriers there. Um, next slide, please. So bird monitoring is really critically important. Um, as signatories to the Iowa, Iowa agreement, we are um, January and July, and we have a lot of participation, especially from youth. Next slide, please. We also participate in um, the Global Birdhouse. There's one coming up 
uh, in uh, on the 9th of October. Uh, youth engaged with that, and so we use that a lot for monitoring using bird lasso and eBird, and we can recuperate that uh, data and, and use it for our conservation action. Next slide, please. Promoting tourism. We started in 2017 to promote tourism. We've produced a map. We've been to the Durban and Darbo in South Africa to, uh, promoting, um, um, that was my, <laughs> I've run out of time. Um, uh, we're promoting tourism, uh, birding tourism in Zimbabwe um, um, to, uh, because many of our IBAs are actually national parks, protected areas that are being encroached by mining and many other threats uh, to bird species and migratory species. Next slide, please. And also a proposed development of the uh, a birding route um, uh, le um, tying up the KBAs in the Kaza uh, area, which is five countries. So huge potential uh, to reach out to other protected areas in other countries, uh, influencing communities and governments to protect uh, at landscape level um, and uh, provide livelihoods, which is critical for communities. Next slide, please. This is the last slide. So adoption of um, protection at landscape level. We were recently involved with uh, the submission of an application to UNESCO as um, UNESCO Biosphere Reserve for Archimani Mani uh, Key Biodiversity Area. Very critically important site for blue swallows, intra-African migrant. And next slide, please. And, and I think that's all. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Julia. It's uh, re really impressive what you're doing in, uh, in Zimbabwe. Baz Tiado is now here, so maybe we can go back to to Senegal, West Africa, to see what happened with the uh, with the shorebirds in in West Africa. Baz, the floor is yours. Bonjour, moi c'est Baz Tiado. Je suis le responsable de la conservation ornithologie du staff de NCD. Uh, je vais vous là, je vais vous présenter uh, la conservation des oiseaux de rivage au niveau du Sénégal. Alors, Geoffrey, allez-y, vas-y. Allez, Geoffrey. Geoffrey, next. C'est bon? Voilà. Là, ça, c'est le, le réseau des sites de, de suivi de NCD sur les oiseaux de l'Ivance, au niveau des pôles. Ça veut dire que de Saint-Louis, jusqu'à Casamas en passant par la petite côte, la zone des Niais. Là, c'est le réseau de suivi euh, des, des oiseaux de NCD euh, dans, 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 dans ces différents pôles, parce que le suivi est assuré par, par ces bénévoles. De Saint-Louis, en passant par la zone des Niais, la petite côte euh, et le bas delta et, et la, la zone de la Casamas. Next. Le suivi des Gico. Geoffrey, next. Tu voilà. Ça va? On a mené les activités de conservation qu'on a menées, c'est le recensement des petits limicoles dans les zones d'humides côtières et le long des plages sénégalaises à marée basse, de Saint-Louis jusqu'à Casamas, dans les ballons, surtout à marée basse. Et que aussi, on a appuyé les, les étudiants euh, sur le titre de deux espèces, la barge à queue noire et euh, le béca, la bécache mauvaise. Ces recensements sont faits avec les équipes de suivi de NCD dans les sites sud aussi. La réserve de Tuk pour la barge à queue noire, et les vasières de Saint-Louis pour les petits limicoles, les Pécasso, les Sanderlines, les Pécasso Cocoli, la cuvette de Gumbel pour les barges à queue noire aussi, et les barges rousses. Et un peu dans la zone des Niai, comme je vous avais dit, qui est très intéressant, euh, on y fait aussi le suivi. Les résultats de nos suivis de 2012 à 2020, euh, c'est fait ainsi pour la famille des, des, des Sarelis Gay, qui, qui est composée de gravelots à colis intrompus, de gravelots à fond blanc, de gravelots pâtes, de petits gravelots de vanneaux éperonnés. Voilà le, la, les statistiques que, que je vous donne par rapport aux différents sites. Si vous voyez, le bas delta est un peu inférieur par rapport à, à, la, à Casamas. Par rapport à la zone des Niai, c'est très important par la, la présence des, des petits, des, 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 des petits limicoles euh, dans la zone des Niai. 
Et si vous regardez euh, la petite côte, elle est, en, elle est un peu en moyenne. Et à Saint-Louis aussi, elle est un peu en moyenne par rapport aux autres sites. Ce qui s'identifie qu'au niveau de la zone des Yaï, les suivis sont, sont un peu, un peu, un peu euh, réguliers au niveau de la zone des Yaï. Mais appuyé par, euh, si vous voyez, c'est appuyé par la RSPV, euh, Life International dans le cadre des projets CMB, même euh, euh, VBN dans le cadre, et Warden Fly dans le cadre de certains projets qu'on a déroulés ensemble. Next, Geoffrey. Ça, c'est la famille des Serenité. Là, c'est la famille des Scolopatidae, qui est composée de barges à queue noire, des barges rousses, euh, des Pécasso cocorli, des Pécasso Peur, des Pécasso de Téni, des Pécasso Mauvais, et les Pécasso Mérite, et ainsi de suite, et des Chevaliers. Ça veut dire que c'est les Pécasso et les Chevaliers et les Barges. C'est ces trois espèces qui composent. Voilà. Et tout le suivi des espèces de la barge à queue noire, si vous regardez par rapport à. Le suivi est assez régulier au niveau de la zone des Niailles. C'est pour cela que la part est beaucoup présent dans la zone des Niailles. Et que en cas de masque aussi, ça est un peu présent. Ça, c'est la barge rousse qui est beaucoup plus présente dans la zone des Niailles et dans la zone, dans la, dans la zone des, des Casemasques, des vasières de Casemasques. Et un peu vers le, del, le bas delta de Salou. Le bas delta, c'est par marin. C'est par marin. Là, c'est euh, la bécation mauvaise qu'on est en train de suivre ici au niveau de l'Agmebos dans la zone des Niailles. C'est pour cela que c'est un peu présent. Ça veut dire que lors de nos suivis en, de, de juillet en vain, on ne l'a pas observé au niveau, au niveau de, de la zone des Casemas. Mais il y a des étudiants qui ont fait le suivi au niveau de la roque et ils ont vu cette espèce. Allez, Geoffrey, next. Là aussi, c'est la Pégamos, toujours dans la zone des Niailles. C'est le suivi des espèces. OK. Euh, pour le suivi des espèces aussi, on a pu appuyer des étudiants qui ont fait des études euh, en, en, en thèse et en, en, en master au niveau de la réserve de et un peu euh, le long du Sénégal, de, de, de Saint-Louis jusqu'à Casamas. Et une étude sur la reproduction des essences, de on a pu appuyer. Et CMB2, on a pu appuyer un étudiant aussi qui a travaillé sur l'application mauvaise. Merci de vos attentions. Voilà ce que vous avez à vous présenter pour le suivi qu'on a fait de 2012 jusqu'à 2020. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Bas. Really uh, interesting. Thank you very much for, uh, for, for having presented. I'm going to invite uh, Honfrida Nadatir from uh, our partner in, in, in Iceland to briefly present us uh, the collaboration uh, of what she's been doing. Yeah, hi. My name is Hongfur Arnadóttir and I'm the executive director of Fuglavern, Börla Iceland. We are very thankful that we have the opportunity to take active part in the East Atlantic Flyway program. It keeps us alert and is a big responsibility. Uh, next slide, thank you. For Fuglavern, being a partner to EFI is useful in terms of uh, supporting the capacity of the organization through technical advice, for example, and in preparing flyway-related funding applications, as shown later in this PowerPoint. It, uh, it is good to have in mind that we are a small office and on only staff of two. Uh, next slide. No, no sorry. Back. We have a project ongoing, uh, funding funded by the Endangered Landscape Program, uh, cooperation of several NGOs and institutes within Iceland. This program is about restoring the watershed landscape of Grunafjörður Ramsar site, that is in the Western Iceland which is a stopover for these three species on their way to breeding areas in Greenland and uh, Canada. The project is mainly about revetting, but the stakeholders are many. Uh, for example, the owner of uh, Salmon River that runs through the area, as well as owner of local industrial area, farmers, the people that live there, uh, and the municipality, of course. Uh, a good bonus would be the value of a carbon credits obtained in the process. Uh, next slide, thank you. 
this is our nature reserve flowy. It's a bird and nature reserve along the east shore of Elvisá River. The reserve holds breeding and migratory species of uh, European importance, and the habitat is equally valuable. Uh, we are now investigating the possibility of doing a proposal for life hunting for this area. There are opportunities to make the reserve both bigger and better ecologically, uh, and revetting of grazing marshes will have a, an immediate GHG emission reduction and the possibility of selling set of offset carbons, carbon credits also. Uh, next slide. We are going to take part in two other project, projects related to flyways funded by the EEA grants, where OTOP was the main applicant, uh, BirdLife Poland, that is. One of the projects is collaboration in peatland restoration for biodiversity and climate between, between Iceland and Poland. And the other project is focusing on managing protected areas in Poland, Norway and Iceland. Next. Here, here is a, in this picture is a large forest in a, an alien species in Iceland planted in a wetland area, a common site. We are investigating a closer coordination with the Icelandic Forestry Association uh, on policies, but their new strategy introduces massive planting in the name of climate crisis and often with alien species. Uh, the waiters that breed here rely on habitat that would change a lot if the planting of forest would uh, go as planned. We have had help from BirdLife, 38 partners signed a request to the Minister of the Environment not to accept this new strategy and we are also in contact with the Bern Convention. We welcome EFI solidarity on the upcoming work on the forestry plans. But, uh, and yes, we are looking forward to soon becoming a flyway hub for the Arctic and Scandinavian part of the flyway. And I'm happy to mention that with our input, IFI has received its first grant from the Nordic Council for flyway work. Thank you. Great. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Alfredo. And now, uh, we're going to move to uh, the other end of the side of the flyway uh, to Zambia. So Switing Kashurwe uh, is going to present for us uh, briefly some results from uh, Birdwatch Zambia. Thank you very much. My name is Switing Kashurwe from Birdwatch Zambia, and uh, I'm going to talk about the East Atlantic Flyway Initiative in our country. So to start with, uh, you may wish to know that Zambia is top oversight for five of the six IFI flagship species. And these are the species uh, that we, we, we have here in Zambia. They are both, my, uh, they are all migratory, sorry. So these species have all been spotted within our core project areas. That is both past and current projects. Uh, in terms of what we are doing uh, along the flyways, uh, we have uh, the biannual waterbed counts on the Kafue Flats, which is the composition of the Blue Lagoon National Park and the Lokingva National Park. So these waterbed counts helps us uh, in assessing the species, uh, the status and trends of uh, the waterbeds, and it is also an opportunity for us to advocate for the implementation of appropriate policies. Uh, for the improved management and also working towards keeping the threats to the habitats. Uh, we also had uh, the habitat restoration project on the Lukanga Swamp. So this project was uh, about uh, controlling an invasive plant species, which is Savunya molesta, using the biocontrol method. So during this project, uh, we also undertook some biodiversity monitoring so this, uh, this biodiversity monitoring used it as a tool to assess the species composition and the diversity of the wetland. We also have uh, the Vouch Safe Zone project uh, in East and Central Zambia. 
So this uh, project is all about uh, providing uh, the self-feeding places and roasting for vouchers, but it, uh, it hasn't only benefited vouchers alone, it uh, has also benefited other species uh, and migratory and resident bed species. So all these projects um, are undertaken together with uh, extensive awareness raising and environmental education activities in, in schools. So in terms of where we are, uh, we recently launched uh, the ETHI uh, initiative uh, to encourage people uh, to send in their sightings of the ETHI birds and also re report uh, the threats that they, they may see that these birds uh, encounter. So we also use, uh, make use of important bird on the conservation calendars, such as the upcoming migratory bird day to profile these migratory birds and uh, educate uh, about their importance and the threats that uh, these birds are facing. So in terms of our next steps, um, we want to make sure that we fundraise uh, so that there is increased uh, monitoring of these species and the flyway. Uh, we also need to engage with uh, relevant stakeholders so that there is a partnership in the monitoring of these species, uh, the flyway and conservation of uh, the migratory, migratory baits. Thank you. Great, excellent feeling. Yeah, it's a uh... Really nice to see what's happening in, uh, in, in, in Zambia, uh, the other end of the, of, of the flyway. Now we'll go again to the middle of the flyway. We go to uh, uh, Tunisia, where and Hisha Masafsaf is going to take us through what AO has been doing in the last day uh, for, for the conservation of uh, migratory birds. So, Hisham, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. Uh, bonjour à Mon nom est Hissam Azabzaf, je suis le chargé de je suis le chargé de, des programmes scientifiques de l'association Les Amis des Oiseaux. Par mon intervention aujourd'hui, je vais vous présenter ce qu'on fait dans le cadre de la conservation des oiseaux euh, au niveau de, du flyway. Euh, ma présentation va aborder euh, euh, quatre points. Le premier point, c'est le, le partage et la dissémination des informations sur les oiseaux migrateurs, pour les estimations des populations et des tendances, un projet de restauration de paysages et d'habitats en faveur des oiseaux migrateurs, euh, les suivis d'une espèce qui est la spatule blanche, et enfin, je vais vous parler de deux préoccupations qui, euh, qui nous sont chères. Euh, L'association des amis d'oiseaux est un membre fondateur du réseau Oiseaux d'eau Méditerranée, qui a pour objectif de promouvoir et soutenir les recensements internationaux coordonnés des oiseaux d'eau en Méditerranée, et plus particulièrement euh, le dénombrement du de, de, de mois de janvier. Et à, ces, à cette fin, euh, on a publié ce rapport euh, euh, qui est une partie d'un rapport euh, de, régional qui concerne l'ISPI et qui analyse les données de euh, 10 années de suivi des oiseaux d'eau euh, qui sont des oiseaux euh, migrateurs. Ce rapport il a été euh, tiré euh, à part et diffusé largement au niveau national pour, euh, bien sûr, sensibiliser les décideurs et le grand public sur les problématiques de conservation des ennemis des oiseaux d'eau. Euh, Une problématique régulière rencontrée par rapport aux données sur les oiseaux migrateurs et sur les, euh, euh, sur les flyways, on, on, on remarque toujours une tendance pour créer, pour chaque projet euh, ou chaque créative, euh, une base de données euh, euh, par rapport à ces oiseaux. Cette plateforme, euh, ces plateformes contiennent souvent, parfois même les mêmes euh, informations. Euh, Pour ça, euh, on, on est euh, euh, dans cette perspective. Euh, J'ai participé le 15 septembre à une réunion euh, regroupant le Wednesday Initiative, Wetlands International, la Tour du Vala, l'Office français euh, de euh, développement. Next slide, please. Afin de préparer 
mesure conjointe des estimations et des tendances des populations d'oiseaux d'eau sur les voies de, voies de l'immigration de l'Atlantique Est et de la Méditerranée et, et du Sahel aussi. Alors, c'est une initiative qui est encore en discussion en cours pour jumeler tous ces données ensemble et réévaluer la, la, les populations des, des oiseaux. Next slide, please. Euh, D'autre part, nous participons à un projet euh, qui est tous spécifique pour les agriculteurs parce que euh, l'agriculture la, intens, euh, intensive euh, impacte la, la biodiversité. Et euh, les agriculteurs, ils sont en train de chercher de plus en plus des terres fertiles et, euh, afin de contribuer à la restauration des milieux et des paysages le long de la voie de migration. Et pour soutenir un, un, un agricole qui autorise la présence de, de la Bifone, l'AO participe à un projet qui a été développé par une association qui s'appelle l'association Les Amis des Captes, euh, qui, euh, next slide please, euh, qui, euh, euh, qui, qui se trouve au niveau d'un parc, d'un grand parc national, une grande zone humide qui s'appelle le parc national du Iskul et qui permet d'améliorer euh, euh, les milieux naturels un peu autour de, de, de ce parc pour euh, permettre euh, aux oiseaux migrateurs de, de trouver leur, leur compte. Next slide. Euh, les, bien sûr, les principaux cibles de ce projet, ce sont les, les agriculteurs, mais euh, euh, on a aussi constaté qu'ils euh, qu ont une connaissance particulière des oiseaux dans la région et qui euh, et qui euh, sont très intéressés à les, à les protéger. Next slide. Un questionnaire il a été développé dans le cadre de ce projet qui a montré que euh, la majorité des agriculteurs connaissent les oiseaux migrateurs. Euh, 80% de ces agriculteurs dans la région indiquent qu'il y a une diminution effective de certaines espèces qu'ils voyaient avant, qu'ils ne voyaient, voyaient plus maintenant. Et une grande partie des agriculteurs reconnaît que le changement climatique accentue tout simplement la dégradation des ressources naturelles par les mauvaises pratiques. Next slide, please. Une des, des exemples d'espèces sur lesquelles on travaille est la spatule blanche, une espèce migratrice. Euh, euh, notre travail euh, 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 s'applique euh, au niveau des suivis de cette espèce euh, en Tunisie. Euh, next slide. Ici, par exemple, on, on, on montre un petit peu l'abondance annuelle de la spatule blanche en Tunisie, qui, 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 hiverne, qui vient hiverner en Tunisie. Et euh, ça montre un petit peu que l'espèce est stable. Ça nous permet de connaître exactement les sites qu'il faut protéger et euh, ça nous permet de suivre les tendances de cette espèce. Next slide, please. Euh, ça nous permet aussi de, de, de reconnaître exactement les sites que l'espèce euh, euh, hiverne ou, ou fait du, du, du stop pour, pour se préparer à la migration. Et ce sont euh, 72 sites qui sont d'importance nationale pour la conservation de cette espèce. Next slide. Ça nous permet aussi de... de, de de, de reconnaître les zones les plus importantes pour la concentration de cette espèce et de euh, orienter les, 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 euh, les actions de conservation gouvernementale pour la conservation de, ce, de cette espèce. Next slide. On lit souvent aussi beaucoup de bagues de, de, de spatules blanches ainsi que d'autres espèces migratrices comme les flamands, comme les ibis. Et euh, ça montre aussi qu'il y a... Euh, qu'il y a une, euh, une migration est-ouest parce qu'on on arrive à contrôler beaucoup d'oiseaux de, 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 qui viennent de l'Espagne, qui viennent de l'Algérie par rapport à l'Ibis, etc. Next slide. Euh, L'idée et préoccupation dont euh, j'ai parlé tout à l'heure, c'est qu'on euh, a un très grand problème de conservation d'oiseaux migrateurs qui est causé par la fauconnerie en Tunisie. Euh, et, et qui, qui tient des milliers d'oiseaux euh, parce qu'ils sont attrapés par des filets, des filets qui sont euh, euh, mis pas d'une façon traditionnelle, ce sont des filets de, 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 de bagages qui sont utilisés pour attraper les filets. Ainsi, euh, aussi d'autres oiseaux sont... Sont, sont aussi attrapés à cause de l'hyperviers, comme ici la tortorelle de bois. 
et euh, on va entamer euh, toute une campagne internationale pour essayer de euh, euh, résoudre ce problème parce qu'au niveau national, on a essayé tous les recours et, et euh, ça n'a pas abouti. La dernière, la dernière diapo, s'il te plaît, Geoffrey. Euh, L'autre grande problématique, c'est qu'on est dans une euh, grande action de conservation d'une zone humide urbaine qui est la zone humide de, de, de Sizumi, c'est la, la, la zone humide au centre de, de, de Tunis qui est site Ramsar, qui est zone clé pour la diversité, qui est euh, la quatrième zone importante au niveau de l'Afrique du Nord, mais qui a un très grand projet d'aménagement qui, euh, qui est en cours et qui euh, ne respecte pas la spécificité écologique de ce site. Et j'espère qu'on pourra euh, vous faire parvenir plus d'informations et que vous pouvez inter intervenir avec nous au niveau international. Et merci. Thank you, Hisham. And... Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, so we are quite late. We went really uh, over time. Uh, still, uh, I wonder if there's any uh, pressing question from anyone on the, from those of us that have uh, had the patience to stay with us in spite of us going over time. Uh, I'll give the room for one, maximum two questions. Uh, And if not, uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to uh, to say. Uh, first of all, I want to just highlight the uh, that that the community around uh, the East Atlantic Flyway, all the all the work that is happening in terms of conserving migratory species, is actually very impressive. So as you saw. Uh, this webinar has brought together really the entire flywheel. We have someone from, from Finland, we have people from, from Poland, we have people from uh, really across the entire flyway, all the way to South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia. So all the stages of the, of the flyway, it's really, really uh, nice to see. Uh, and we had different... Uh, areas of, uh, of, of, of interest. So we had a, a little bit about the, the, the frameworks. We heard a little bit of uh, about how, what, what are the results when we managed to mobilize partners. And then of course, in the end, we, the, the last section, we heard a lot of what's, what are the small steps that are taking place in order to preserve the, the, the sites and the birds that we care for. Uh, <clears throat> I think there's a the, before. I think we can uh, we can be uh, happy to see that there's all these activities, and I think we should realize that okay, there's lots of problems, but also there's a lot of uh, goodwill and collaboration. We should carry on doing this. Uh, so all this was organized in the framework of the World Bird Migratory Day. So remember that uh, of the weekend, there's going to be a more activities uh, mm -hmm. around this. In particular, there's the Global Bird Weekend, uh, which has the intention of, or, or the, the, the goal of uh, stimulating people to go outdoors and go just bird watching and then just report what you see and see in, in a fun and competitive way. So uh, you can register your team and see if, if, if you manage to see the most species. Uh, I think uh, since we're so late, then I will just conclude with the, with a big thank you both to the speakers and to the attendees. Uh, it's great to have uh, so many people willing to participate in this and so many people willing to watch and learn about what's happening along the flyway. Thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>